Guest speaker will be from uh, Kids for School, uh, who'll give an update on the work there. So we've 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 had Kids for School a few times before, so uh, it's an update on that. And there'll be an opportunity to contribute to the work through uh, retiring offer offering, and uh, supper will be served afterwards. Then on Friday, uh, the men folk have an option of joining Churchtown for a visit to uh, um, a dairy farm there on the Seven Mile Strait. Uh, on Saturday then, another big event. This is something the ladies have been planning for for some time. Uh, it's the Women's Fellowship Spring Conference held here this year. And since it's being held here, uh, they're expecting uh, 100 to 150 ladies to attend the event. And uh, Dermbold ladies are, are going to be heavily involved. I know they've been making lots of preparations um, already. So if um, as, as much help as possible could uh, come along to that on Saturday. Now, with regard to that as well, it's not on the sheet here, but if the ladies could uh, are to, to meet immediately after today's service, uh, and probably if you head up to the front here to Martha's um, seat or whatever there, you can um, congregate there. So that's after the service, some uh, final arrangements. And then uh, a thanks to the men folk who came along uh, yesterday for the tidy up around the church property. And the, the session appreciates the work very much. Saturday then, CY, meeting in the hall, 7.30 to 9. Uh, and if you notice over the sheet and over the other side there, there's a, a Presbytery CY event coming up on Saturday week, a volleyball competition. So if you could keep that date in mind as well. So with that, I'll hand over to John then for today's service. Well, good morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Jonah 3 and verse 10, where it says, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. We're thinking today of God's wonderful compassion shown here to the Ninevites. We'll be thinking of how this, this is the, the pinnacle of God's compassion as it's recounted here in this chapter. God turned from the disaster that he'd spoken of because they repented. And God is a God full of compassion for us. He sent us the Lord Jesus Christ so that we could have a relationship with him, so that he would, we would escape the judgment that is to come through repentance and faith. Let's come and let's worship our God. We sing as we begin from Psalm 135. Psalm 135. <clears throat> and we sing it to tune 37. Psalm 135, and we're singing stanzas 1 to 4. And then seven and eight. Stanzas one to four and seven and eight. Here we are praising God. Oh, praise the Lord, the Lord's name praise. You servants of the Lord, praise him, who in the Lord's house there do stand within the courts of our God's house. Well, here we are. We're in God's house. We are the people of God and we're here to worship him. And why are we worshiping him? Well, stanza two, we're chosen 
We're God's special people. We're his treasured possession as he speaks of. We also worship him because he is the God, stanza three. He, our Lord, above all gods, he is. And then we see his acts there performed or spoken of in stanza four. They go on to be spoken of in stanzas five and six, which we're not singing. And then here we sing of God again. To Israel, his people, he gave their land as heritage. Your name, O Lord, endures always. Your memory, Lord, throughout every age. Because the Lord's own people all will surely, will his sure vindication know. And to all those who serve him, he will also his compassion show. Here we are, worshipping our God, who's full of compassion for us. And so let's come and let's worship our God. We stand and we sing Psalm 135. We sing stanzas 1 to 4 and then 7 and 8 to tune 37. Let's stand and sing praise to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do come and we stand within your courts. Lord, we bow our heads in your house because we come before you, the great, the awesome God. Lord, we've sung of your compassion to us, that you would choose us for yourself, that you would impart to us your gift of salvation, that you would send your Son, your only begotten One, to die in the place of sinners, that we might not face your judgment, but know instead life eternal. Lord God, we, we praise you that you're the God that walks with us through every day of our lives, that you promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us, that even, Lord, when we wander far from you, you're like that good shepherd who goes out and pursues and seeks out that lost sheep. You're like the father who stands watching, looking for the return of the prodigal son on her, the horizon. You're like the father who speaks to the elder brother and reminds him of all that he has been offered in Christ. Lord God, we, we praise you. We praise you for your compassion. And we're sorry, Lord, for our forgetfulness of it. Lord, we're sorry that we're so quick to uh, expect more of you and demand it. We're sorry to think at times and be tempted by the evil one and by the world to think that you are cold-hearted, that you don't love us, that you don't have our best interests at mind. Lord God, we're sorry for how we don't give thanks to you more often for uh, the great God that you are. We're sorry that we don't see your, your compassion in the various uh, spheres of life which in we work. Lord God, we seek your forgiveness. And Lord, we thank you that we are assured of it. We've just read of you relenting from your disaster towards the people of Nineveh because they repented of their sin. And Lord, here we turn from it this morning. We confess it, Lord, and we seek to walk uh, far from it. And now walk in your ways. Grant us the grace to do it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read from God's Word. Let's read from this third chapter of the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 3, page 928. Jonah chapter 3, we, we looked at the first uh, couple opening verses of this chapter uh, two weeks ago when we last studied it, and we saw God uh, restore Jonah to service again, even after he had sinned so grievously against God, had been an unreliable servant, had rebelled against God's word, God called him a second time, and today we plan, God willing, to study the rest of this chapter uh, together. So we begin Jonah chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go, 
to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and they all put all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did, And how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Amen. Boys and girls, do you want to come to the front? Well, boys and girls, I want us to think for a little moment about God's compassion. And we want to understand what that word compassion means here because it's really important for our, for our sermon today as we come and consider God being compassionate. Now, I want us to start maybe thinking about some of the dangers there might be in our lives that mommy and daddy might warn us against. What might they t- teach us about the oven? The oven would be Hot, yes, that's right. What might they say about the matches? Maybe the matches sit in the mantelpiece beside the fireplace. Isla? Yes, they'll say not to play with them in case you burn yourself, that's right. Then we'll think about outdoors. What about the farmyard? What might Daddy or Granda teach you about the farmyard? Grace? Yes, that the tank's dangerous and you have to stay away from it. Maybe about the farm machinery, that it's, it's dangerous? Or what about the animals on the... Yes, don't turn your back on an animal. And that you're to keep your eyes and watch it. And why is it that mummy and daddy teach us these things? Why do you think they warn you of all these different dangers? James... Yes, you're on fire today. Yeah, yeah, in case you get injured or, or, or hurt yourself. They, they don't want you to, uh, to, to be in danger. They care for you. They love you. They're showing their compassion for you, boys and girls. That's what the word compassion means. It's caring and having a concern and an interest for others. And God shows his compassion to Nineveh today. God sends Jonah to warn them of the danger of continuing in their sin. And God warns them that if they continue in their sin, that God's going to judge them and that they'll die for it. And boys and girls, God warns us of these same truths in his word for us. Each of us have sin, and where's the sin in us? It's in our hearts. And God warns us that unless we turn to him in Jesus Christ and know forgiveness... We will perish for our sins. Boys and girls, God is a God of compassion for us too. That when we turn from our sins and we turn to him, he forgives us of our sins. So we're going to be thinking of God's compassion today. Once you get your seat, you can go back to your seats, okay? Today we're going to be praying for the church in Carrick, Fergus, uh, Carrick, is one of the vacant uh, churches uh, presently in the Eastern Presbytery. 
Uh, they've made out a call, so they have a couple of weeks ago to uh, the Reverend uh, Peter Dundee, and so we want to pray for them as they um, seek God's will, and Peter does also as to whether he's to remain in Clare or not. And we want to pray for the work there as we've been praying through the denomination. But before that, we want to sing from Psalm 106. At Psalm 106, and we sing it to tune 168. Psalm 106 is one of those history psalms that recounts uh, particular activities in Israel's life. And uh, here we, it comes from them being brought out of Egypt, going to Horeb, and then the verses that we're singing about is the next generation that lives in Canaan. We're singing about the, uh, them settling in the land, and once Israel had settled in the land, they forgot God and they disobeyed God, and God's anger is stirred up against them, his righteous indignation for them. And that's what we sing of stanza 30. Against his people kindled was the anger of the Lord, so much that his inheritance, his people, he abhorred. And then he gives them into those Gentile hands. We know of the, the judges that come and the nations that attack and saved in those closing verses. And so we sing together, At Psalm 106, we sing stanzas 30 through to 36. We sing it to tune 168. Let's stand and sing praise to God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are a faithful God, that you're a God who's faithful to your character, that you're a God who does not change on a whim, but you are consistent in your displays of your being to mankind. And Lord, they change only as the situations on earth change, Lord. And so you show your consistency through that. You show justice, Lord, when we sin. And Lord, you show your grace when we repent. And Lord, we thank you that we have been able to taste and see that you, the Lord, are good. And that you're a God full of grace, as we've just sang of in this psalm, one who relented out of grace and because of your great loving kindness, even after Israel had rebelled against you. And Lord, what confidence that gives us during our lives in those times, Lord, when we wander from you, when we disobey you, when we, Lord, fail to meet the standard of your laws we do each day. You're a God, Lord, who has compassion upon us and forgives us as, Lord, we believe in you and confess our sins and turn to walk in your ways. Lord God, we thank you for those gospel truths. We thank you that we share them with our brothers and sisters in Carrick, Fergus. And, Lord, we pray that you'd be with them in these years of vacancy that they are experiencing and going through at this time. Lord God, we thank you for their intermoderator, Reverend Hawthorne. We pray that you'd bless and uphold him strengthen and enable him for the task, Lord, each uh, that he has of caring for this flock alongside his own flock in Ballyclare. Lord, we pray for the congregation. We thank you, Lord, that you've brought it to a united call to be able to issue it to the Reverend Dundee. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with him as it goes through the formalities of going through the various courts of the church before it's presented to him. Lord, we pray that you would Make your presence especially known to him in this time of uh, uncertainty and disruption to family and life and church life. We pray that he would know your uh, strength given to him and that he would know your will for him. We pray that you would give patience to the congregations of Clare and Carrick as they await, Lord, uh, his answer. And we pray, Lord, that it be accordance to your will and we pray that they would be acceptant of your will also. Lord God, we pray for their, the work of the congregation. We pray for its witness in the market on the Thursday and its coffee mornings that it runs on a Saturday morning too. We pray that, Lord, as they open their doors and as they go out into the, into the centers of um, population within the town too, that you would bless, Lord, their, their witness and their, their testimony to Christ. Bless the conversations that they have. Lord, would they be able to season them with uh, Christ? 
and be able, Lord, to have opportunities in season to share your word. And may they see people come in. May they find people who are searching. May they, Lord, bring comfort to those, Lord, who uh, need consolation. And Lord, may they show them the beautiful Savior that they have in Christ. Lord, we remember the work of the woman. Lord, we thank you for the preparations that they've been busy doing over the last months um, for the spring conference this Saturday. Lord, we pray that you would be with the ladies here as they serve practically, Lord, the, the women of the, the wider denomination. And Lord, we pray that it be a uniting event for them, an event, Lord, where they see their place also as part of the wider body of Christ church. We pray, Lord, that you be with the, uh, the, the, uh, the teaching, Lord, that will happen uh, th through the, uh, the conference. We pray, Lord, that you be with Mrs. Fleming as she addresses the ladies. We pray for those who will have um, parts to play in the service also. We pray that, Lord, all would be in a, uh, orderly done, and we pray that it would be for glory of your name. Uh, Lord, we pray that all the practical arrangements that have been made, Lord, that all would run smoothly, and that, Lord, it would be a great day for the, for the woman here in Jambog and the woman of the church. Lord God, we are amazed by your grace that you showed to Nineveh, and how, Lord, she immediately responded to your call of the gospel. And Lord God, we long for it here in our own district. And Lord, we long for it, your grace to take great, deeper root in our own hearts. Lord, we long for those who are outside of Christ, who have wandered from Christ, uh, from within our midst, Lord, to come and see him again and uh, witness and experience your compassion. And so, Lord, pour out your spirit and work as you worked in Nineveh. Lord, may you save many, Lord, in this area for the exaltation of your name, we pray. Be with us, Lord, as we study your word now. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we want to read once more from God's word, this time from the New Testament. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 here, uh, Jesus um, is speaking in parables. Parables were um, earthly stories with a heavenly mean, meaning. They were him using illustrations from life uh, to uh, teach a spiritual truth. And we want to read the first, of the first two of these in Luke 18. Uh, the first is about the persistent woman and then the... the the repentant sinner of the tax collector. And we, we, we learn two things here. We see the persistence of the woman's prayers, or that's the, the teaching that God is teach, uh, Christ is teaching here, the persistence in prayer. Just as this woman was persistent in asking the evil and wicked judge uh, to hear her case, so we're to be persistent in our prayers. And we see that in Nineveh in their um, urgent prayers and crying out to God for forgiveness. And then also we learn another truth about prayer here with the tax collector. His humility as he depends on God's grace, as he's remorseful and uh, contrite about his sin, as he pleads, God, have mercy on me. And so we read Luke 18, verses uh, 1 to 14. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said a certain town, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, 
When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looking down on everyone, everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He did not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. Well, turn with me back to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, page 928. Each week in our studies in Jonah, we have focused on what we learn of who God is. In every study, we have observed an attribute of God's character on display as he deals with Jonah or through Jonah. So far, we've witnessed God's plan and his presence, God's sovereignty, that God saves and that God restores. And our purpose in having this focus is to understand the original meaning of this message to the first readers, Israel. As we focus on God's character, we learn the lesson God was teaching his wayward people. God was seeking to woo Israel back to himself as he reminded her of who he was, of what he was like, of the different characteristics of his being so that Israel would remember once more her first love. And today... We come and we consider the the rest of the third chapter. And in it we find an array of God's attributes. We see his autonomy, his immutability, his justice, his mercy, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness and his grace. But one of God's perfections stands out from the rest. The text keeps drawing our attention back to one particular aspect of God's being again and again. God's compassion. God's compassion. God's compassion overarches all that occurs in the remainder of this chapter. It's God's compassion which leads him to send Jonah to Nineveh. God's compassion marks Nineveh's response to Jonah's evangelism. And finally, God's compassion dictates his reaction to Nineveh's repentance. And so it's God's compassion which is the thread which weaves through the twists and the turns of this portion of Scripture. And so therefore, there's there's no prizes this morning in guessing what the title of our sermon is. God's Compassion. Let's firstly think about God's compassion in sending Jonah. That's your word, boys and girls. Sending Jonah. God sent Jonah to Nineveh. And at this point point in time, I want us to get a sense of the magnitude of God's compassion here. And as we do so, we pick up where we left off last time in the middle of verse 3. Let's read the next phrase. We we thought of Jonah's obedience last time, and now we pick up in the middle of verse 3, and it says, Now Nineveh was a very important city. This sentence is quite obscure in the Hebrew, and another translation maybe helps us here understand the meaning of the words here. Now Nineveh 
was a great city to God. Nineveh was a great city to God. That's what it means when our translation translates it as Nineveh was a very important city. Who was it important to? Well, the text, the original actually says Nineveh was a great city to God. It was important in God's sight. And in that phrase, we get a glimpse of the heart of God. God cared about Nineveh. He was interested in its citizens. God's concern for man went beyond the limits of Israel. It wasn't just his chosen people, his special possession there in the land of Canaan that he cared for. God's interest and his concern, his care for the well-being of mankind stretched beyond the bounds of Israel and even rested upon Nineveh, a pagan city. God valued her. But the importance and the value that God had for her was not nothing to do with her prestige or her wealth or the fact that she was the superpower of the day. No, God was interested in its well-being, particularly its spiritual well-being. God was not indifferent to her fate. It brought God no joy to bring a message of judgment against Nineveh. He saw her sin He knew what it would bring upon her if she remained in it. And so God, filled with compassion for her, sends Jonah to Nineveh. God had compassion for Nineveh. Nineveh was a great city to God. But God's compassion is even more profound than that. We're going to build like a tower. God's compassion piece by piece by piece until we, it towers above us here. God's compassion gets even more magnificent when we appreciate Nineveh's character and conduct. We get a flavor for it in verse 8. The king of Nineveh describes their way as evil and their deeds as violent. Their life was the antithesis of God's way. God's direction was this way, and Nineveh's was the evil way, going in the opposite, away, far from God. And yet God valued that city. Think of that word violent as well. And their violence, it's referring to their deeds. Remember we noted this word back in Genesis 6, Moses used it there in verse 11 to describe the extreme wickedness of mankind in the days before the flood. Immediately before the flood, mankind was marked by this corruption and this violence. It was the total depravity of man, as bad as it could get. That's what Nineveh was. Entirely wicked. And you only have to read the history books to get a flavor of her wickedness and her evil deeds, evil way. She's, she was proud, corrupt, and oppressive. They were a bloodthirsty, ruthless, and immoral nation. There was nothing commendable or appealing about them. Yet, what do we read in verse 3? Nineveh was a great city to God. It was important in his eyes. He valued her. But God's compassion gets even better when you stop and you consider that God sent Jonah to this city. That he sent Jonah with the good news of salvation and forgiveness to them who were sinners. They deserved God's wrath. They were not worthy of God's word. God would have had every right to have wiped them out, to have rained fire from heaven And no injustice would have been done against that city. However, God doesn't instantly destroy her. Instead, God says to Jonah in verse 2, Go to Nineveh and proclaim the message I give to you. I hope we're getting a sense of the scale of God's compassion here as it's displayed. 
But it gets even more impressive when you think about the message that uh, Jonah proclaimed. It's summarized for us in verse 4. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now some might say that's a pretty harsh message. You might even be asking, where's the compassion in that? Maybe it even makes us feel a little uncomfortable. Perhaps we would have preferred if it had declared God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or maybe we'd have preferred something like the free offer of forgiveness being declared. And that being the summary of Jonah's sermons as he preached and evangelized in Nineveh. But we'd be wrong to criticize or feel embarrassed by this summary. After all, remember, this is God's message. Remember God said in verse 2, go and proclaim the message I will give to you. And so this is God's message to Nineveh. And we know that God is a God of compassion. We've been seeing and tracing that through these opening phrases. And God's message was one full of compassion. How can we say that? Well, for starters, it was out of compassion that God sent Jonah to Nineveh. To make them aware of the danger that was ahead of them. It's out of compassion that God doesn't minimize their sin because it's no small thing in God's sight. It's because of God's compassion that he warns her of her demise if she continues on that path. It's his compassion which leads Jonah to speak of their need of faith. It's out of compassion that God calls them to turn from their old life and to follow him. This is a message full of compassion. Imagine you were walking on one of the coastal paths, downhill, Port Rush, Ballycastle, wherever it is that you like to go for your coastal walk. And as you walk along that path, you find at a point just at the cliff face that part of the path has subsided with the storm of last night. Would it be unloving of you to warn others as you turn back that the path had subsided? Would it be wrong of you to beckon them not to try and cross this as they look at it and say, well, I might be able to climb across the railing there and get across the other side of the path? Would it be uncompassionate of you to want to preserve their lives or to grab your kid's hand and not let them go any further? No, of course not. It would be the loving, the right, and the compassionate thing to do to warn others. And how much more for one's spiritual state, for someone's eternal well-being. It's out of compassion that we talk about sin and guilt, and God's wrath. We're doing the loving thing to warn others of the coming judgment and eternal death and how they will perish under God's wrath if they don't don't turn. We're showing compassion as we direct people to Christ, as we call them to believe, as we plead with them to repent of their evil ways and their violent deeds. It's because... We're concerned with their eternal well-being, that we share these bold, offensive and uncomfortable truths with unbelievers. It's because we care for them that we tell them these things. Non-Christian, it's because we love you that we tell you the truth about sin. It's because we don't want to see you perish that we tell you about Christ. It's because we don't wish you to suffer God's judgment that we plead with you to turn from your ways. We're not judging you. We're not wanting to condemn you. We're not looking down our noses at you. We long for you to be delivered just as we have been. We desire for you to share in the salvation we have in Christ. It's out of compassion that we don't hide our faith in the public square. It's out of compassion that we live by these truths 
even in society. As Christians, we're accused of being unloving when we don't celebrate pride, call a man a woman, or use someone's preferred pronouns. We're berated for not celebrating the sexual revolution, new feminism, or abortion as a woman's right. We're accused of hate speech, bigotry, radicalism. The only thing that we're guilty of is showing compassion. We would not be showing the compassion of God or the love of God if we were to do otherwise and embrace these lies of the world. That said, let's, let's end with a word of caution to ourselves, Christians. Compassion isn't just about what we say. It's just important, as important that we show compassion in how we say it. A true message is no excuse for rudeness or aggressive speech. We've got to speak the truth with compassion. God's compassion in sending Judah. Let's think now of God's compassion in Nineveh's response. In Nineveh's response. That's your word, boys and girls, the word response. That's how they reacted uh, to uh, or acted in the light of what God said to them through Jonah. Verse 3, we're still in verse 3 here. We're told that a visit requires three days. That's the last phrase. A visit required three days. In comparison to cities today, Nineveh did not have a large footprint. It was, but it was densely populated. Just like our cities have its Belfast has north, south, east, and west Belfast that we talk about. Well, Nineveh would have had its different districts and quarters also. And so it would have taken Jonah time to have systematically worked through it. And he estimated and expected that it was going to take him a three-day journey to get through the city, to go into the different neighborhoods and to speak the, uh, the gospel uh, to the locals there. And then we're told in verse 4, Jonah starting his mission. On, on the first day, Jonah started into the city. But within a, within a short period of time, quite possibly and most likely in that first day, people began to profess faith. How amazing is that? Verse 5, the Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. And you notice how when we read this, um, uh, the narrative and this event, there's no mention made of the second or the third day here. We don't hear about what Jonah did on day two and how far he'd gotten through the city and how he reached the end of the city in verse three, or sorry, on the third day. It seems as if these conversions began immediately. That as soon as Jonah started into the city and declaring God's message to Nineveh, that people believed in it, as we read of in verse 5. There's an instant response here to Jonah's evangelism. Moreover, verse 5 seems to suggest, suggest that the message seemed to take nearly a life of its own here. It spread through the people through all its various classes, right into the palace where we read in verse 6, when the news reached the king of Nineveh. And then, and then the king wonderfully repents also. We're given no indication here in the text that Jonah had an audience with the king. In fact, verse 6 seems to suggest that the news made its way there of its own accord. People were reporting back, talking about it. Maybe servants of the palace heard about it, believed, and as they came into the palace then, the king became aware of it also. And how is it that they believed? Why is it that Jonah's ministry had such an impact on this city? God's compassion. It's God who made the word declared effectual in their hearts. It was his compassion which led him uh, to give the Ninevites faith. God gifted it to Nineveh. 
He let them believe. He imparted his free gift of faith to them. Without God making Nineveh or the Ninevites attentive, they'd have never listened to Jonah. Without God creating an anxious thought, they'd never have batted an eyelid at what Jonah had said. Without God applying the word to their hearts, those men, women, and children of every class of Nineveh would not have believed. Without God convicting them of their sin, the nobility would not have been grieved by their wickedness. Without God convincing them of the reality of judgment, not one Ninevite would have repented of their sin. It's God who brings the change. And of course, we know from reading the New Testament that it's the Holy Spirit that works in the hearts of people to bring them to faith. And so it's God who takes the outward call that was made by Jonah and he made it effectual unto salvation in the hearts and the lives of these Ninevites. God wasn't obligated to save any in Nineveh. Giving them the opportunity to have heard Jonah was enough compassion. But God goes beyond that and displays even more compassion as he saves them as the word is preached. As he changes their lives from the inside out, God shows his compassion. God's compassion meant Nineveh received the gift of salvation and the hope of eternal life. There'll be Ninevites in heaven because of God's compassion. We'll meet them one day. They'll tell us their story because of God's compassion to them. And God's shown this same compassion to us, hasn't he? How compassionate is our God that he would give us what we don't deserve, that he would let us encounter the gospel and not only encounter it as it's preached or as it's conversed, as it's taught in the home, whatever that, uh, that occasion be, that he would open our ears to hear the message, that he would open our eyes to see our sin. That he would open our mouths to cry out to him for forgiveness. That he'd open our minds to believe in him. That he'd open our hearts to receive him. Christian, this is our God. He's a God full of compassion. And we will owe everything to him. We have unending thanks to declare to him for his unlimited and unreserved display of compassion towards us in saving us from our sins. He is such a compassionate God. And so next time that we're tempted either by the flesh, the evil one of the world to think that God's uncaring or stingy or selfish or we doubt his love for us. Let us recall his compassion to us. He gave us the right to become children of God. And non-Christian, this can be your experience too. You can encounter it for yourself through repentance and faith, just like the Ninevites, just like we have had to come and do as well. Cry out to God, plead with him and let him know that you want to experience his compassion for yourself. Seek him out in, your, in his word. Read his word and you will witness the God of compassion. He's a God of compassion. He'll not turn anyone away. He will show it to you. We've seen God's compassion in sending Jonah to Nineveh. And then God's compassion displayed in saving the Ninevites. Let's lastly think about God's compassion 
in his reaction. God's compassion in his reaction. That's your word, boys and our girls, react. How did God react to Nineveh? That's what we're thinking about now. Verse 10, let's read it together. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. As God looked down from his judgment seat in heaven, he sees now a very different people to the people that he had seen back in chapter 1, verse 2. Look back there just for a wee moment. Chapter 1, verse 2, God says to Jonah the first time, go to Nineveh, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But now, after Jonah has preached on that first day as God looks from heaven, he sees a changed people. He sees a people that have faith in him, verse 5. They've believed. They've accepted what Jonah has said as God's word. They've taken it as truth and they've acted in the light of it. God's witnessed this people humble themselves also, verse 5. This was the purpose of their fasting and their adorning themselves with sackcloth. It was an ancient way of showing contrition and remorse for sin. And this was no outward formalism or insincere jester. We see here that Nineveh was really serious about their humility. Their fasting was extreme. Not only do they abstain from food for three days, but they also abstain from drink. And not only them, but also, as we saw there, or read there earlier in verse 7, their beast, their herd, their flock, every animal that they owned was not to taste food or drink water either. It was extreme. It was beyond the norms. And moreover, what do they do? They, They take off their comfortable clothes and they put on sackcloth. Sackcloth was made of goat's hair. It was coarse. It was itchy. You would not have been wanting to wear it for very long. And these people at least wore it for those three days of fasting. Their outward actions show their genuine contrition and submission before God. And then think of the the king. Look at what he does uh, as well. In verse 6, he rose from his throne. A king never left his throne. That was the seat that he always sat on. He took off his royal robes. He covered himself in sackcloth. And sackcloth was also something that only the poor would have worn. And he sat down in the dust. He doesn't even sit back down on his throne again. He's not worthy of it that he sits in the dirt and the ground. And there he grieves over his sin. And then in verse 8... Uh, Verses uh, 7 through to 9 are an instruction that comes from the king and the nobles. And I think we're to already see, given the order of events in this chapter, that the people were already doing this, but it comes now with royal assent that they encourage everyone to do likewise also, to follow uh, what's already being done of humbling themselves, putting on the sackcloth, crying out to God and seeking forgiveness. And that's what we read of now in verse 8. They confess their sins, and their sins are described as being urgently, that they're to call urgently on God. It's not to be half-hearted. Another Bible translation uh, translates it as, call on God mightily. Or another version says, call on God earnestly. Their confession was real. They were truly sorry. They had understood the the gravity of their sin, and so they sought God's forgiveness. Their sincerity is shown further by how they are encouraged, in verse 8, to give up their evil ways and their violence. 
Confessing your sins is one thing, saying sorry to God. But the other side of true confession and repentance is turning away from that sin. And that's what the king encourages them to do. And it's obviously in the light of what Jonah has taught them. And so they were to turn from their evil ways. They were to turn from the violence that was in their hands. These people were to make radical changes in their lives. Not only do they confess their sins, but they intend not to repeat them. They want to transform their lives. That was the effect that was coming in them. And God sees it. He observes the activities of man on earth. He witnesses the Ninevites' broken and contrite heart. He watches their lives being radically altered. He sees their faith and repentance is authentic. And that's why we read in verse 10 that he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. God relents as Nineveh repents. God's actions here are no different to a parent with their child. At times, a child will choose a a wrong path and the parent has to speak firmly to them. The parent might even warn them of the consequences if they continue on, on, on this trajectory. And the parent's subsequent attitude and actions towards this child depends on what the child does next, doesn't it? The parent relents when the child is receptive to the word. The parent has no need to follow through on their threat because the situation has now changed. The child has responded and so the parent reacts appropriately to the changed circumstances. And that's what God does here. God's entirely consistent to who he is. He does not change. He relents from the disaster because Israel, or sorry, Nineveh had responded to his warning. But if, Israel, if Nineveh had not repented and believed, 40 days later, Nineveh would have been overturned. God's compassion. He relented from his judgment. God's reaction to Nineveh continues to be the hope of the believer, the unbeliever today. The king hoped, as we read all there in verse 9, that God would have compassion, that God would relent from his fierce anger and that they would not perish as they repent. And that promise is the same today, that God will not let anyone perish under his judgment who's turned in faith and repentance to him. There's the opportunity to escape the final judgment. Just like Nineveh did through sincere faith, genuine confession, and serious turning from evil. This is God's compassion. We've encountered today the God of compassion. The one who sends his servant to an undeserving people. The God who saves those who are not worthy of his salvation. The God who turns back from destroying them under his fierce anger. Stop and consider and let's respond to the God of compassion. Have you experienced God's compassion for yourself? Can you thank him continuously for it? Do you recall his compassion to you? Are you stirred to worship and adore him for the magnitude of his compassion shown to you? Let us behold our God. Amen. Let's stand as we're able and we'll come before God in prayer.
Father, we are amazed, astounded at your compassion. It's so unbelievable, Lord, that you would show such love and care and interest, that you would save us who are undeserving. We who are not worthy of your mercy or your love, that you would relent from the disaster that you had threatened against us. We thank you, Lord, so much. Lord, we can't thank you enough, and we're sorry that we are so forgetful of it. And we ask, Lord, for you to keep it always in our minds, that when we're tempted, Lord, to forget what you have done for us, that we recall, Lord, your amazing display of compassion towards us. Lord, stir us up greater worship. Enlarge our hearts, Lord, to adore you more for your compassion. Lord, grant us an ability to be able to articulate these wonderful truths to those whom we meet, Lord, to be able to meditate and confer upon them, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's sing as we close from Psalm 107. Psalm 107, and we sing it to tune 78, Dunlap's Creek. Psalm 107, and really, Psalm 107 nearly carry, well, it does carry on on the theme that we just sang off earlier in Psalm 106, though it's speaking of a later time in Israel's history. We're now thinking of God rescuing Israel after the exile, of how God relented from his uh, continued judgment against Israel because she had cried out to him. And that's what we thank, sing about in stanzas one to six. Here we're thanking God that he's good, that his love endures, that he redeemed uh, his, his people, that he gathers them out of the, the lands of north, south, east and west. And we can see the significance of that for today that God is saving people across the world, that he's delivering them from the judgment to come, that they will not perish. And God shows to them his compassion. And so then we're told, stanza 5, let us, we could say, give thanks now to the Lord for love that never ends and for his works of wonder done unto the sons of men. We stand and we sing Psalm 107, stanzas 1 to 6 to tune 78. Let's praise God. And now, people of God, lift up your heads and receive the Lord's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.